Hello, very good evening everyone. Thank you all for coming on a very rainy, cool and wet uh, Friday evening. Uh, my name is Jack and I'm one of the organizers for the Living With Me uh, seminar series. And I hope you have uh, joined us for our uh, past few uh, events. I hope you continue to support us. And uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, two minutes ago, our next seminar is going to be on the 18th of December. Uh, over here at Theatre Works, same time 7.30 to 10.30. So hope to see you uh, next month. And uh, without further ado, uh, I, I will say a few words uh, about today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar is uh, titled um, Linear Narratives. So we are going to look at the linear narratives of Singapore history. So um, we'll, the talk today uh, will investigate three linear narratives. And uh, usually uh, linear narratives, uh, where, I, where, I, where I talk to my uh, Singaporean students, I would like to talk about linear narratives as a uh, TTK, you know. Why TTK? Because it's like the big, yeah, only one direction. <laughs> yeah. But we are, today we are going to look at uh, Singapore history from various different uh, trajectory and very different perspectives. So it's not a big, yeah, you know, type of like linear history, but we're going to look at it from uh, three different perspectives. So we are very happy and honored to have uh, three distinguished speakers with us this evening. Uh, we have Ko Keng Wee. Uh, and uh, we is going to look beyond Raffles at, uh, at the historical forces behind the rise of modern Singapore. Uh, our second speaker will be Liu Tai Kun, and uh, Tai Kun will examine uh, mostly other history of civil society from the 19th century. And finally, our third speaker, uh, Philip Golden, will unpack the notion of our national development from third world to first and wonders if better names exist. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Ko Keng Wee. Uh, Keng Wee joined the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at NTU as an assistant professor in 2014. He had previously served as curator in the Dr. Yo Bao Sao uh, Center for Overseas Chinese Documentation and Research in Ohio University Libraries between 2007 and 2010, and as assistant professor in the Department of Asian History at Seoul National University uh, from 2011 to 2014. So we're very happy that he's now back in Singapore. Uh, he was the head of the Southeast Asia program in the Department of Asian Languages and Civilization at SNU, and Cambridge specializes in maritime history, business history, Southeast Asian history, and world history, as well as the history of overseas Chinese. So uh, he's also currently involved in projects on mobility in colonial Malay world and Chinese business history in Southeast Asia and South China. So without further ado, please join me welcoming Ken Wing. I do a lot, uh, I work on the history of the Malay world, so I'll try my best to give a sort of regional and uh, possibly global perspective uh, to uh, Raffles, uh, to the early history, to the place of Raffles in the early history of Singapore. Right, uh, like, uh, okay. uh, thank you also, Jack, for introducing. Uh, I hope, uh, it, uh, unlike the, what you said, the Titik Kya, and the, a very good example of the Siswa Kya. For the <laughs> last 10 years, I've been traveling around, so... <laughs> so, anyway... Uh, I'm, I'm, sorry. Yeah, I'm here to, uh, today to talk about, uh, mainly about Raffles, uh, and the idea of free trade in the early, uh, in the historiography of early uh, modern Singapore, right. and 
theme of the series is about myths, right? Uh, I would like to say a little bit, a little bit about my understanding of myth uh, before I start uh, on my presentation. So I, rather than understanding myth as certain falsehoods or certain uh, misrepresentations, I would like to see, I see, I tend to see myth as something of a half of a half truth, but right? it's in a way a structuring of certain truths, certain facts to fit certain narratives, ideologies, certain views of the past. Right, so in my presentation, I'm not trying to debunk certain myths or to shatter certain myths. I'm just trying to maybe point out certain new, possibly new perspectives, uh, which has which have been uh, emerging in the last few years about the place of raffles and free trade in the founding uh, in the early history of Singapore. Right, so today I'm going to deal mainly with uh, three issues. One is, as I mentioned earlier, the role of raffles in the founding and early rise of Singapore. The idea of free trade, uh, the theme of free trade in explaining the early success of Singapore and in understanding the, uh, the early history of Singapore and how we can perhaps look at Singapore from a regional and global perspective, this early history of Singapore. Uh, most histories of, uh, of the founding of Singapore and the early history of Singapore start with Raffles. And of course, I must start with a picture of the man. Of course, I, I, I think you're all familiar with him. <laughs> It's a ritual, right? Uh, <laughs> but Raffles is, oh, of course, Raffles is associated with the founding of Singapore, with Singapore itself, right? When you talk about Singapore, the image of Raffles comes up. And Raffles still uh, occupies a very important position in the Singapore imaginary. You have Raffles of the Constitution, the various Singapore became like the embodiment of these ideals on free trade, morality, reason, uh, the project of civilization and progress uh, for the archipelago, uh, if not for Asia as a whole. Right? And he was seen as laying the foundations for modern Singapore and uh, Brit the British imperial project in the archipelago. Right? But as we, as we examine uh, Raffles' role in the founding of Singapore and the early history of Singapore, we should also look at the recent uh, re-evaluation of the, bio, uh, the, the image of Singapore, the light of, the, oh, sorry, of Raffles, the uh, biographical uh, of, of his biography. Right? Uh, a lot has been uh, written about Raffles, but a lot of the early work has focused on a certain hagiography of the man, right? often embellishing his, uh, exaggerating his family background, uh, selectively forgetting or emphasizing certain aspects of his career. So, uh, you can find these histories, uh, biographies, biographical representations of Raffles in the works of people like uh, Bolger, Han, Collis, right, which used to be rather standard fare. Right, but if you look actually at the Dutch literature from the 1850s, you see from a very early period, very early period a 
uh, re re evaluation of Raffles, his image, and his place in Malay world history, right? especially uh, his role in uh, the massacre of the Dutch garrison in Palembang, which uh, doesn't really get talked about when we talk about Raffles in, uh, in Singapore. Right? The, uh, one of the key works in this reevaluation re in English would be. Uh, Syed Hussein, Hussein Alatas, the late Syed, uh, Professor Syed Hussein Alatas' uh, book, Sir Stanford Raffles, uh, Thomas Stanford Raffles, uh, Schema or Reformer. And recently you've seen other works like uh, by John Mastin, Nadia Wright, and Syed uh, Khairuddin in trying to uh, delve deeper into this persona of Raffles. But when we look at the history of Singapore, right, the founding of Singapore, uh, Despite the claims of Raffles himself to being the founder, the one who uh, decided on the location of Singapore based on uh, his knowledge of old Malay world history, uh, you see, when you look at the archival sources, other narratives appear, other, uh, other facts appear, right? Like for example, uh, Singapore was actually already known among his contemporaries, among sailors, shippers, who, uh, who uh, British country traders who trade in the archipelago. And if you look at the narrative surrounding the founding of Singapore, you also see that uh, one of the, the, the captains of the ship, uh, that Captain Daniel Ross, uh, was the one who actually pointed out Singapore as an alternative to Taiwan after they found that it was unsuitable as a site for a new British settlement. Right? And then uh, uh, the founding of Singapore, the, the, established, the creating of a, a creation of a British establishment in 1819 was not the first time the idea of founding a settlement on Singapore was put forward. Uh, Alexander Hamilton claimed to have been given, uh, offered uh, Singapore uh, as a place to build a British establishment in the early 18th century. And uh, in, early, in the early 19th century, the Dutch governor of Malacca, uh, of the former Dutch governor of Malacca by that time, uh, Abraham Kuperis, talked about uh, Singapore as a very suitable settlement. Right? And then, uh, when you look at this early history of the founding of Singapore, you see uh, also the role of Farquhar, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the figure of William Farquhar, right, who has not enjoyed the same amount of attention. But as, we, uh, as I shall hope to show later, he actually played a very, very important role in the early survival of Singapore and the early uh, growth of Singapore as a port. So, besides Raffles, besides people who already knew about the port, we also, I will also try to talk about uh, Papua, Crawford, and other administrators who played uh, a role in the early history of When we look at William Papua, uh, he, he actually, like Raffles, he had uh, a long career in uh, the Malay world uh, prior to the founding of Singapore. He was actually the resident and commandant of Malacca, uh, when he was under British rule, right, he enjoyed, he had very good relations with neighboring rulers and prominent merchants in Malacca itself, to the extent that he was often referred to as Raja Malacca. Right. So, he, uh, that was his, because of his standing among the uh, local rulers in the Malay world region. Uh, he was seen as very important to the British uh, expedition to Java. He was recruited by Raffles for the expedition. and. As the British, uh, as the former Dutch colonies in uh, the Dutch, in the Malay world, in, uh, were handed over to uh, the Dutch government after the Napoleonic Wars, it was also Papua who were sent on missions to the neighboring kingdoms to ensure that the British uh, maintain their presence in this area through treaties. Right. Uh, in, in the case of Singapore, in the case of uh, the founding of Singapore, he was of course with Raffles as they, uh, uh, as they looked for a settlement, uh, for a place to uh, establish a new British settlement. And he was actually, uh, I believe, one of the key figures in the negotiations with the Johor elites, especially in the way Raffles, or so he claimed, played on the politics within the Johor community. Because Papua would have been very familiar with this politics. Because in 18, around 1830, if I'm not wrong, he actually stopped the Bandahara of Baham from sending forces to assist Tengku Hussein, uh, who was trying to resist the installation of his half-brother, the recognition of his half-brother as the ruler of Johor Riau. 
Right, so he was someone who was very, very uh, familiar. Right, he, through his, uh, due to his uh, uh, tenure as the resident and commandant of Malacca, he had very close relations with the Malacca uh, merchant communities. Right, so uh, if you look at the early history of Singapore, the first few major Chinese uh, merchants in Singapore, most of them were from Malacca. And I believe this connection with Malacca, which Raffles did not really have because he was secretary to the government in Penang, uh, was very important right, in the early history of Singapore. Uh, he also had very close relations with neighboring uh, rulers in, around the uh, Malay world area and those in the eastern archipelago. Right? He understood the local and regional dynamics of politics and trade, and that was to shape the way he ran Singapore as an early set, uh, the, as, a, as a British settlement uh, between 1819 and 1823. He has often been uh, described as too laissez-faire, too uh, easygoing, too uh, liberal with the uh, running of the settlement. But we can see, uh, as, uh, but we can also understand it in a different way, in the sense that he knew how things operated at that time. And when you found a new settlement, Though you wouldn't want to alienate the elites, the ruling elites around you, or the merchant communities that are coming in at that time. So he was a very uh, he played an important role in maintaining the relations between the the British merchants and uh, Sultan Tengku Hussein and the Temenggong. And he also tolerated things like the slave trade and gambling, which received rather bad press in the history books uh, about early Singapore. But if you understand the politics, the the economy, the social life at that time. Those were the things that were part and parcel of port city life, even in Dutch Batavia. Uh, in the uh, and one of these one of the best examples of how Papua actually worked to promote Singapore, to protect Singapore in, uh, in its early years can be seen in the letters uh, that are found in the British Library which have been published uh, as a collection by uh, Bagriya Saleh, right, uh, in which you can see how he wrote, he, uh, he wrote letters during this period to the Bugis region in Riau, uh, notables in, uh, in Riau asking them to come over, especially in Kuputri, who actually helped the regalia to the Johor Riau kingdom. Uh, he wrote notables to the uh, rulers both in the Johor network and outside, to the Benhara of Pahang, Siak, the rulers of Siak, East Sumatra, Pontianak, and even rulers in the so in this way, right, he 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 basically uh, used diplomacy. He used his relations with rulers and merchant networks in Archipelago to promote Singapore, and that I think was much more important than, uh, as we shall see later, free trade or uh, similar policies in the rise early rise of Singapore. But uh, in, he had major differences with, uh, with Raffles, uh, including uh, the interpretations of the 1819 treaty, the rights and rules of the Temenggong, and differences over town planning, uh, gambling, and other policies. Right. Another figure that, uh, that's very important in the early history of Singapore would be John Crawford, who uh, he was the one who actually expanded the meaning of free trade in Singapore from just the uh, the freedom of traders from all over to come to Singapore to trade um, by removing port duties and charges. And he did so at a very critical period, uh, as we shall see later, because that was the time when the Dutch were trying to attract the Bugis back to Riau uh, uh, as they competed with, uh, Sing with Singapore. But he also negotiated the formal treaty with the Sultan of Temenggong, basically effectively ceding the island of Singapore and surrounding waters to the British East India Company, and uh, finally getting the Sultan and Temenggong to uh, formally give up their monopolies, dues, uh, in return for a monthly stipend. So, it, uh, as we look at, as we compare the three of them, we can ask the question, like, what exactly was Raffles' contribution if Papua and Crawford played such important roles? As I said, I mean, when I'm, when I'm uh, looking at the myth, so-called myth of Raffles, it is not so much to say that he didn't do anything at all, but to sort of narrow down and clarify what exactly did he do, right? 
of course, he, besides uh, his role in the founding of Singapore, he played, I think his most crucial role during this early uh, period of Singapore's history was in lobbying the high political circles in Calcutta and London. He only made certain short visits to Singapore, I think two, right, during this period. And for, there was a period of three years when he never stepped foot uh, in Singapore. So everything was in the hands of Papua. Right? And he played a very central role in uh, breaking the claims to influence uh, on, on an authority on the island of the Sultan and Temenggong. Right, previously the, the, the Temenggong's men were patrolling the port areas, collecting protection, uh, protect, collecting gifts and dues from people, and often uh, making life rather, in, at least in the history of towns, rather miserable for the traders in the port city area. And he, uh, together with Crawford, basically uh, were able to redefine the British position in Singapore and their relations with the Sultan and Flamengo. Of course, he was also responsible for laying out the plans for the town of Singapore uh, and taking measures to uh, promote education in Singapore while well, promoting his uh, vision of what uh, Singapore should be. Right? Then, uh, then we come to Papua and Raffles. Right? Despite uh, their differences with Raffles over the administration and vision of Singapore, uh, we can see how Papua played a very, very important role uh, in the survival of Singapore as a, early settle, as a British settlement, in the way he handled relations with the Temengo and the Te Tengku Hussein. Because if you look at the past examples of British attempts to establish bases in uh, Southeast Asia and the Archipelago, most of them failed because of the breakdown of relations with the local rulers they sought to work with. And uh, then you can see how uh, Crawford right, played a very important role in streamlining and consolidating uh, the British settlement and early administration of Singapore. But when we look at uh, the other dominant narrative in Singapore's early history, uh, which is free trade, uh, we see how free trade was used as the justification for a British settlement east of Malacca, mainly to count uh, as uh, growing out of anxieties over Dutch monopoly and exclusion, right, and the need for a station to secure British rights to free navigation and trade in the area. So free trade, in that sense, was very crucial in the rapid rise of Singapore as a regional entrepot. Right? Uh, and free trade became uh, bound up with the other ideas of enlightenment that became associated with Singapore, such as progress, civilization, that were championed by Raffles and members of other members of the circle. But when we look at the history of early Singapore and we, and we relate it to the picture of early of British trade in early 19th century Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole, uh, we can see certain issues that sort of undermine the, uh, the effectiveness of free trade as an explanation uh, both for the British founding of Singapore uh, as, a, as a port and in explaining the success of Singapore in, the, in its early years. In short, free trade didn't really result in the survival of Singapore. Other factors did. But uh, first, I'll just... Uh, just go ahead. Uh, basically, when we look at uh, the idea of free trade is often used as an argument against the Dutch East India Company and the idea of monopoly, right? But we have to understand that in the, uh, when we talk about monopoly during early modern Southeast Asia, in the case of the Dutch East India Company or British East India Company, the monopoly applied only to Dutch nationals and to uh, English, British nationals. So although they tried to prevent other uh, European competitors, right? It was more of a monop monopsonic uh, system Right, in which they, uh, the Dutch monopoly system was more of a contract between the local rulers and the, uh, the Dutch East Indian Company for the local rulers to sell goods to them at fixed prices and not to sell to other Europeans. Right? Uh, they often did not apply to other archipelago and Asian traders. So this idea of monopoly applied mainly to uh, European traders that competed with the Dutch East India Company for Asian goods going to the uh, European market. But by the time we come to the founding of Singapore in 1819, uh, the company was actually no more. Right? The Fourth Anglo-Dutch War had actually effectively crippled the company 
and in the treaty signed with the British government, they, uh, and they, the clause was included on the freedom of navigation and trade in the archipelago between the British and Dutch governments. So the, 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 the Dutch government technically, if it went by the terms of the treaty, had to allow the British to navigate and trade in uh, areas which they claim as their spheres of influence. And the company actually became uh, bankrupt uh, by 1799. So when the, com when the colonies were given back to the so-called Dutch, it was being given back to the Dutch uh, government. Right? And the Dutch government saw the uh, archipelago not no longer in terms of a commercial empire, but of a territorial empire. So trade was not so important to the new uh, rulers of uh, the former Dutch colonies in the archipelago. Although in some of the early treaties, like those with Riau, you see actually reference, references to the free trade uh, only in so far as native traders were concerned. When we come to European and American traders, uh, there, was, there were limits on their trade or preferential duties. Right. Uh, in the same way, right, when we look at the British East India Company, the same transition was taking place, but uh, with a certain uh, caveat. Right. The British East India Company, uh, since the 1680s, had basically relied on private traders for the archipelago trade, who played a very important role in pioneering the China tea trade. Right. And uh, this include figures like, uh, included figures like Francis Light, Right, and these country traders knew the archipelago very well. They knew the uh, trade in straits produce, in archipelago, archipelago produce very well. Like Francis Light, he could speak, uh, he could speak and read uh, both uh, Thai and uh, Malay. Right, and he was actually for a time uh, administrating the island of Phuket. Of Francis uh, But what's important in, in with regard to the argument of free trade and the East India Company and the founding of Singapore is that when the at the time when uh, the East India, uh, when Singapore was founded, basically the British uh, traders and the Brit British East India Company had enjoyed a certain control, uh, almost monopolistic control over the opium trade and the uh, textile trade in India. And this was very important because when you look at uh, archipelago trade at that time, opium and Indian textiles were the most important commodities from the Indian market. So, if the Dutch East India, the, the British East India Company enjoyed um, uh, uh, close to a monopoly, although it was forced to give up certain monopolies, and British traders had a certain a lion's share of this, uh, a control of these uh, opium and uh, Indian textile exports, then the idea of free trade becomes a sort of an empty letter when, you, when the British use it to justify the founding of Singapore uh, to counter Dutch monopoly. Right. So, in a way, this British monopolistic control of opium and textiles was crucial to the early rise of Singapore because Singapore was created basically to protect the interests of the British country traders, British merchant houses in India, in archipelago who had a stake in the opium trade, in the textile trade. And once they came here, they attracted traders from other parts of the archipelago who wanted these uh, commodities. Right? And in addition to opium and textiles, the British country traders were also the main gun runners, uh, war stores traders in the archipelago, right? which uh, the Dutch East India Company did not uh, engage in earlier. Right? So uh, basically, the British emphasis of, on free trade was basically aimed at allowing free British access into uh, Dutch markets in areas controlled by the Dutch, rather than uh, through a general uh, adherence to I the ideals of free trade in their own areas of control. Uh, another important factor in the rise of Singapore uh, would be uh, the bookies factor. But when we look at the early trade of the archipelago, you see how the British country traders, the Bugis and the Chinese uh, junk traders uh, formed a sort of triangle, triangular relationship. Right? They, they were mainly responsible for carrying spices and other produce from the eastern archipelago to the western archipelago and carrying opium, uh, textiles and war stores to the eastern archipelago. Up to the 1850s, you see 
Singapore Free Press lamenting that the boogies have already gone. There goes our market this year for our arms, the guns and the cannons and the cannonballs that we have in stock. So they play a very, very important role in archipelago, in the trans-archipelago trade. Uh, maintaining close relations with the Bugis homelands and uh, maintaining close relations with Bugis communities in uh, the Malay world itself. So uh, what happened was that after the founding of Singapore, as during the first few months of uh, Singapore's existence, the British settlement's existence on Singapore, uh, a major rupture broke out uh, in Riau between the Bugis and the Bugis trading communities there and the Dutch. Right? Uh, this dates back to, uh, to earlier rivalries between Bugis leaders in Ria. I mean, the history of uh, Singapore and its relation with Johor Ria often emphasize the Bugis as a monolithic group. But when you look at the dynamics, uh, they actually consisted of a very, very, very group in which distinctions were also made between what they call the Bugis Peranakan, local born Bugis, and the Bugis Jati, the Bugis from the homeland. Right. And what happened was that in December 1890, Arun Balawa, the leader of the so-called, if you want to call them overseas Bugis communities in South in uh, Riau, he held a wedding, and when they celebrated the wedding, they fired guns into the air. And the Dutch garrison was wondering why were guns fired. They asked, they demanded that they send uh, representatives to answer for their actions. And when these, uh, this delegation came, they were forced to disarm at the gates of the Dutch fort. Uh, if, you, if you read the older Malay world literature, you know that you never ask the Bugis to disarm. <laughs> right. And so uh, a fight broke out, and uh, the, five, the, uh, the five members of the delegation were killed. And among them was a close relative of uh, Arun Balawa, one of the Bugis princes leading this community. What resulted was a siege of the Dutch uh, fort, and the Thereafter, the flight of 500 over Bugis uh, from Riau to Singapore. That effectively uh, relocated the, the center of the Bugis networks from Riau to Singapore. Right? And that, I think, was together with the British country traders in Singapore, was more important than any uh, attraction afforded by the freedom of trade in Singapore in explaining the rapid rise of Singapore. When you have a whole network shifting to your base, it's no longer so, it's, uh, you basically become the new sector. And in 1823, when the Dutch tried to lure Arun Balawa back with a promise of a monthly stipend, he came back, but only with his family and uh, with his followers and slaves. The other Bugis traders stayed on in Singapore. So, uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is that it's not just free trade policy that ensured the survival and early commercial success of early Singapore. In a way, it was the diplomacy of Papua, but also the fortuitous coming together right, of the uh, uh, existing structures of trade in the wider Malay world at that time that allowed the uh, survival of and flourishing uh, development of Singapore as a uh, major, as a major, into a major port in the region. So uh, when we look at the uh, history of the interconnected, the intertwined histories of Raffles and early Singapore, I think we, there's a need to sort of separate the history of Singapore from the hagiography, the narratives uh, surrounding Raffles, uh, the, the persona of Raffles, right, as reformer, as visionary, right? And in a sense, uh, distancing Raffles from Singapore, contextualizing his claims, his opinions, and also re-evaluating the roles of Bakwa and Crawford in the founding uh, and early history of Singapore because that still remains to be done. Recently, the last few years, uh, you can see more and more historians writing about the need to look at the roles of these, these individuals and other individuals besides Bakwa. Right. And uh, also we have to look at the limits of free trade in explaining the early survival and rise of Singapore. Right. The British arguments of free trade were based more on their own anxieties than on the actual dynamics of trade. Uh, whether in their areas, uh, how they practice trade themselves, or uh, in the structural dynamics of trade uh, in the region, which people like Mark Wu, uh, knew very well. The interconnection between politics and trade. Uh, so in a, in a sense, when we look at the early, uh, the historiography of early modern Singapore, 
we need to, I think, demystify Raffles to clarify his claims and representations concerning his role in the founding and development of Singapore and demystifying the discourses of free trade right, in understanding this early history. Uh, it also needs to be contextualized right, in regional and uh, global, in terms of regional and global forces uh, during the, between the late 18th century and the uh, mid 19th century. Uh, as well as uh, looking at perspectives of groups uh, of people other than the British officials and traders. Because we draw a lot of British archives in a way, but in a way we can read the archives, I mean, this word has been used to that, across the grain uh, to, to sort of get new perspectives. But there are also uh, important bodies of literature, of uh, materials which are now increasingly being made freely available online, like through the British Library, digitization projects, and uh, through projects by London Library, in terms of Malay manuscripts, Chinese manuscripts, and all these give uh, uh, other perspectives. So, uh, yeah, I would like to just end, end it on this note, and perhaps uh, ask also, maybe we can also, uh, if we look at this early modern history, is there also need to save it from the uh, history of the nation state? But uh, that's for another speech. <laughs> <laughs>